no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Time and space dictate the reality of our universe. Einstein taught that these were not different elements of reality, but combined the two into a concept of space-time. As a child, I thought of space as what was left over if you took everything else out. My first introduction to the idea that space was a physical thing and could be manipulated was a long time ago. I grew up on a small farm about five miles from the nearest town. No one has lived at this farm since my stepfather died over a decade ago. I went back not long ago to see what was left. If you look right here, you can see our barn. This barn was built by his hands in the 1960s and is still standing. It was a good childhood in many ways. I got to grow up on horseback. Here I am on War Eagle, the fastest horse I've ever ridden, by the way. Back then, there were, of course, no cellular phones and no internet. We did have this, though. And through this, we could receive three television channels, which were all anyone had back then. ABC, CBS, and NBC. It was my job to go up on the old house and turn the antenna in the right direction for each of these channels. I enjoyed doing this, especially when reruns of my favorite television show were about to come on. This show had explorers, scientists, and doctors traveling through the galaxy, finding all kinds of incredible things. They were able to do this because of something called a warp drive. The warp drive would fold space itself, allowing the ship to travel faster than the speed of light. The power to fold space came from their incredible antimatter engines. Combining ordinary matter with antimatter turns one gram of mass into almost 25 gigawatt hours of power. When this show first came on the air, humans were six years from walking on the moon. As I type this today, humans are once again about six years from walking on the moon. Not a lot of progress for a half century, I don't think. But that might soon change. Very creative people are working hard to make interplanetary travel possible. But what about that fantastic idea for interstellar travel? Will it ever be possible? Someday this equation may take its place in history, next to the others that have progressed humanity toward the stars. Called the Alcubierre equation, it shows how to actually warp space. Making the warp drive theoretically, if not yet technologically, possible. Let's look at the research being done in this area and see how close we are to traveling to those stars. When we talk about warping space-time, what exactly are we warping? What is space? If we get closer and closer to our television screens, we will see that it is made of single dots called pixels. These pixels, seen from a distance, create the images on our screens. These are the smallest unit of these images. If we imagine a three-dimensional space and divide it up into pixel-sized cubes, these are called voxels. Video game programmers manipulate these to create the virtual reality we experience in the games. This begs the question, is there a similar limit to the resolution of our reality? Does reality have a space-time unit producing the reality we experience? Three-dimensional space-time voxels of reality? It does. If we zoom in on the fabric of reality, we come down to a unit called the Planck distance. The Planck distance is the smallest length anything in our universe can have. It is the limit where the uncertainty principle and other quantum effects prevents anything from being smaller. 1.616255 times 10 to the minus 35 meters. Now that is unimaginably small. Nothing shorter than this can ever be measured. That means a sphere of this diameter would be a type of voxel for our reality. Space-time itself has a finite reduction size. Let's call it a roxel for reality voxel. Just because I don't think anyone else has, and it sounds cool. Time itself can also be defined by this length. The Planck length limits how small a wavelength can be. 
this is the most powerful any gamma ray can be, and sets the time limit to reality. As the time it takes to travel this distance is the smallest piece of time possible. I like the term chronon for this limit. In addition, space-time is plastic and can be bent and stretched. How can we bend reality? In fact, we bend it all the time. The mass of your body bends space-time. As you move through the world, you are distorting it with your presence. Now, the mass of a human being is so small that the effect is imperceptible. But a larger mass, like that of an entire star or a planet, creates a gravity well. We call the consequences of this distortion gravity. Sir Isaac Newton thought that gravity was a force instantaneously communicated between two masses. Einstein showed that gravity was in fact the effect a mass has on the space-time continuum, a distortion of the fabric of reality. We have to picture this in two dimensions usually. Here you see the effects on space-time of the mass of a star and how its distortion causes a planet to orbit. This effect can be seen in this imaging of Lagrange points. Lagrange points are gravitational hills or valleys created by the interaction between two massive bodies orbiting one another. There are Earth-Sun Lagrange points and Earth-Moon Lagrange points. These are given the names L1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Three of them can be thought of as hills, L1, 2, and 3. If you park your spaceship here and use just a little fuel to stay in place, you'll be carried along in the same position relative to these two masses. Two of them are gravitational valleys, L4 and 5. These are always 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind an orbiting body. Any mass that is stationary in this valley will stay in it and be carried along without having to use any fuel at all. There are asteroids trapped in these valleys, in the orbit of Jupiter and even the Earth. These are called Trojan asteroids. Though Jupiter seems to have thousands of them, the Earth only has two identified. 2010 TK7 is a 300 meter asteroid at L4, which is the leading Lagrange point, ahead of the Earth in its orbit. And 2020 XL5 is there also. We're not quite sure of its size. These asteroids will stay in this valley unless a force is applied to remove them. We haven't found anything massive in L5 yet. Scientists recently discovered that the distortion of space time by the planets in our solar system has created a type of gravitational highway constantly changing paths that a moving mass could travel through to make it through space faster than we had thought possible. Think of it like starting at the top of a mountain and coasting your car down a road rather than burning fuel to get somewhere. These highways would be constantly shifting and we would need computers to plot them for us. But we can take advantage of them to travel faster through the solar system. These gravity maps will help us save fuel as we travel and get us to where we're going faster. But this doesn't help us to get to other star systems. The nearest star to us is Proxima Centauri, 4.25 light years away. A light year is the distance light would travel in one year. This is about 9.5 times 10 to the 12th or 9.5 trillion kilometers. That puts Proxima Centauri about 40.2 trillion kilometers away. It would take thousands of years for our fastest rockets to get there. Even if we invented fusion drives, it would take most of a century. Even antimatter drives would take decades. If humanity is ever to explore the stars without being immortal, we will have to find another way. The warping of space-time by mass and the effects it could have on travel times led scientists who wrote fiction to imagine that ships could warp space to travel to other star systems faster than light speeds. We are all familiar with this from Star Trek and Star Wars. Warp speed has become a common phrase for something that is really fast. Dr. Miguel Acubier Moya was born in 1964 in Mexico City. He attended the Colegio Ciudad de Mexico, and his favorite TV show was Star Trek. I like him already. At the age of 15, he wanted to become an astrophysicist. He obtained an undergraduate degree in physics and completed a master's degree in theoretical physics in 1990 from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He traveled to Wales to finish his PhD in general relativity and worked for the European Space Agency at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Potsdam, Germany, studying the physics of black holes. In May of 1994, he worked on a paper titled The Warp Drive, Hyperfast Travel Within General Relativity, that was published in the science journal Classic and Quantum Gravity. This was the world's first introduction to the Alcubierre Drive. He developed a theoretical means of traveling faster than light that did not violate relativity. We all know that nothing can be accelerated to a speed equal to that of light. 
One is the energy has mass, and as the kinetic energy of the ship increases, so does its mass. In this way, the mass of the ship, as it approaches light speed, becomes nearly infinite. This means it would take a nearly infinite force to accelerate the nearly infinite mass. Hard to do, even with antimatter engines. Dr. Alcubierre developed a model that would allow a ship residing in flat space to contract the space ahead of it while expanding the space behind it. This warp bubble is technically known as a hyper-relativistic local dynamic space. And like a moving walkway at the airport would move the ship through space without the ship itself actually moving. Space would be moving. And space can move and expand or contract faster than the speed of light. After the Big Bang, the universe expanded much faster than the speed of light and is still doing so today. Dr. Alcubierre's design would need the energy equivalent of the mass of Jupiter to power it, though. And now we come to Dr. Harold White. Dr. Harold White is the Advanced Propulsion Team Lead at NASA. He took Dr. Alcubierre's equation and refined it to require less energy. He described this refinement in a paper titled Warp Field Mechanics 101. Dr. White showed that if the warp bubble was shaped like a torus or donut, it would be much more energy efficient and make the concept more technologically feasible. He has described a test instrument called a warp drive interferometer to look for space-time distortions created by their test device. An interferometer divides laser light into two streams, then recombines them to cancel each other out. If there is a distortion of space-time, the beams will no longer cancel and the change is detected by sensors. This means that real scientists at NASA are working on a warp drive. In fact, this spaceship, the ISX Enterprise, imagined by Mark Rademacher, is based on Dr. White's design. It has a forward torus to compress space and an aft torus to expand it. It would only require 700 kilograms of mass converted to energy. This is 63 exajoules and still an incredible amount of energy. So the scientists will have to keep refining their equations until this drive is technologically feasible. But it does prove that the dreams of science fiction fans are possible, if not immediately, then perhaps soon enough for our children to explore not just the solar system, but new worlds around distant stars. By the way, though I never got to meet all of my heroes, I did get to meet Captain Kirk, Lieutenant Uhura, Sulu, and Chekhov, and later Captain Picard, Riker, and Dr. Crusher. Though I know they were actors, the characters they portrayed gave me hope that the future could be better than the past. I hope it does the same for you and your children. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Please help support us on Patreon if you can. And stay safe. At Astra Proterra. Without further ado, uh, let me say hello to my friend and my colleague, uh, Sonny White from Johnson Space Center. The stage is yours. Uh, thanks, Pete. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to join me today. Uh, as part of coming into this, uh, this series, uh, I was asked to maybe talk a little bit about what got me into uh, working the space industry, uh, what was some of the background that inspired me. Uh, I grew up uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, just outside of D.C. in Virginia, uh, and spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, going to the Air and Space Smithsonian uh, in, uh, in, in D.C., and I was really inspired by uh, all of the uh, uh, displays that they had there of uh, the Apollo program, uh, a lot of the aircraft. Uh, so I think I got the bug uh, at a very early age to want to get into uh, uh, the space program. Uh, so it was, it was quite a treat to be able to eventually find my way uh, working at uh, NASA on human spaceflight uh, back in uh, 2000. Uh, and so hopefully we'll have a, a lot of years in the future to try and contribute to the cause that we all kind of uh, uh, care about in terms of trying to go and explore and, and figure out some new things. Uh, just a little bit of background on some of the stuff that I do uh, that's a little bit uh, higher in the TRL. Pete talked about the fact that uh, I do work with some higher TRL stuff. Uh, I've done some work with trying to integrate uh, things like haul thrusters into human spaceflight. And so you see a little uh, a montage of uh, some of the projects I worked over the last couple years. Uh, trying to integrate uh, uh, things like haul thrusters into human spaceflight uh, platforms. You see the, uh, on the top left there, um, the International Space Station, we looked at using 
uh, hall thrusters uh, to provide some uh, drag makeup. So we uh, spent some time trying to figure out how to integrate those uh, onto the space station. Um, typically in human spaceflight, we always think of rockets that have uh, nozzles and they make a lot of smoke and a lot of noise and have a thrust weight ratio greater than one. So it took a little bit of uh, 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 time and effort to help people uh, overcome uh, uh, the perspective that low thrust might not necessarily be something that we can use, but it turns out uh, it really can help uh, with human space exploration. And so uh, we looked at several other things about using uh, uh, low thrust in space propulsion systems. Uh, on the bottom right, you see a, a, a concept that looked at uh, trying to use hall thrusters with some uh, assets in the Earth, Moon, Lagrange point uh, area. This was kind of a precursor to uh, the asteroid mission. And uh, we also did some work with uh, uh, DARPA to kind of think about uh, uh, ways that we might be able to do uh, some collaborative efforts. Uh, but these are all concepts that uh, try and address uh, getting out of low Earth orbit into cis translunar space, uh, maybe one day uh, out to Mars. It's at one and a half AU. Uh, but what if we want to go through and explore the rest of the solar system? What if we want to get out to uh, some other locations with people uh, in the outer solar system? What if we really want to try and uh, uh, go to some place uh, that's even further, some type of an interstellar destination? I think you have a talk on Kepler. Uh, in a couple of days, uh, and Kepler is identifying a lot of very neat things uh, that are out there, and we're finding out that uh, there's a lot of planets out there, uh, and uh, our solar system is not unique uh, from the standpoint that uh, it has uh, uh, bodies that orbit the sun. So that tends to make you uh, think about what does it take to actually accomplish that. So let's segue into a, a, a much lower TRL discussion. I'll talk about two things. A little bit about the idea of a, a space warp, and then we'll talk about uh, a form of electric propulsion. Uh, you might have seen in the news, uh, we're working on a JSC called Q Thrusters, and so we'll talk to you guys a little bit about that and some of the data we presented uh, at the Joint Propulsion Conference uh, in Ohio. So <clears throat> when we talk about interstellar space flight, uh, uh, a lot of people really have no grasp on how far these distances are uh, compared to uh, what we can do today. Uh, so I think in terms of state of the art, uh, the Voyager 1 spacecraft is a really good illustration of the best that we've done so far in terms of a, um, uh, an interstellar mission. So the Voyager 1 spacecraft was launched uh, in the late 70s. Uh, it gave us all those really nice pictures of the outer planets in the solar system that kind of inspired us. Uh, it's been on its way for about 30 years. Uh, it's moving at about 3.6 AU per year, and, and AU is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, it's currently at about 120 astronomical units out into the solar system. So we get asked the question, <clears throat> how long would it take Voyager 1 uh, to make it to our nearest star if it happened to be going in the right direction? It turns out it's not. Uh, Alpha Centauri is almost due south uh, from the planet. Uh, but if it happened to be pointed in the right direction, how long would it take for it to get to Alpha Centauri? It turns out it would take a ridiculously long period of time, 75,000 years. Uh, and so I don't know about you guys, that's a really long time to sit on console. Um, so. Uh, but anyway, it really does highlight the fact that interstellar distances are very, very difficult, difficult compared to anything that uh, uh, we've done or ever thought about doing. To kind of uh, uh, continue to highlight uh, the challenges associated with interstellar uh, spaceflight, um, I want to talk about a project that was convened by the British Interplanetary Society uh, back in the, uh, the 70s uh, to look at going to Bernard Star that's about uh, six light years away. Uh, and they wanted to get there uh, in 50 years. Uh, the spacecraft that they um, uh, developed as part of that uh, study using, I think this was uh, pulsed fusion propulsion, uh, the spacecraft they developed uh, and published in their paper was uh, pretty big, around 54,000 metric tons. And you kind of see a photo there uh, that compares the Daedalus to the Saturn V rocket uh, uh, to scale. Uh, and I've also interposed a picture of the International Space Station uh, as a comparison. And so I sat on console for almost all the missions uh, that built the International Space Station, and it took all the resources of all the major spacefaring nations over 10 years to assemble uh, the space station. And that's only 450 tons. So that's uh, over 100 times uh, more mass uh, than the International Space Station. So interstellar flight is extremely difficult and can be a very time-consuming uh, um, uh, uh, pursuit. So you could ask the question, what if you wanted to get somewhere very quickly? What if you wanted uh, to try and cover that distance from Alpha Centauri in some time period that's not measured in 
uh, decades, centuries, uh, or millennia? What if you wanted to make it in less than uh, four, uh, four years? Um, it turns out that the, um, uh, the same framework that establishes uh, the, the speed limit, the cosmic speed limit, uh, you cannot exceed the speed of light. Uh, there are two loopholes uh, within the uh, 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 mathematics of general relativity that potentially uh, allow you to go somewhere uh, very quickly without uh, locally uh, leaving your local light cone. One is the idea of a wormhole, uh, and the other is the idea of a space warp, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So the idea of a space warp works on the principle that you can expand and contract space uh, at uh, any speed. It's not uh, restricted to uh, C. Uh, we know that uh, inflation occurs in nature uh, when we look at light that comes to us uh, from stars that are in galaxies very far away from us. Uh, that light has been uh, redshifted uh, since the Big Bang 13.7 uh, billion years ago. So we know that uh, inflation is a, a real phenomenon and it's uh, part of uh, general relativity. Uh, and so nature can do it, uh, can we do it uh, in some purposeful way? And so it was this idea that uh, motivated uh, uh, Miguel Acubier to publish a paper uh, in the 90s that kind of captured this, uh, this idea in mathematics. And you see the concept here uh, on, the, on the screen. And so when you look at the math and you try and uh, envision what it might require, uh, you see a little surface plot there that represents the expansion and contraction of space. Space is contracting here in the front of the spacecraft, uh, and space is uh, expanding here in the back. Uh, when you look at the uh, energy density term, you end up with a spacecraft that has this uh, donut type of uh, apparatus uh, that surrounds this uh, little football shape uh, spacecraft. And so the football shape might be where you'd have your uh, sensitive instrument, instrumentation uh, or any uh, payload that you're uh, very uh, uh, worried about. Or if you wanted to be bold, uh, maybe some type of a, a human crew. <clears throat> now the metric had a, a lot of good appealing characteristics uh, when you think about the idea. Um, at that, uh, that little center uh, area, that, that blue disk you see on the screen, uh, it has a couple of good characteristics uh, for the, the, the concept of a mission like this. It has uh, uh, the divergence of phi is zero, so the, the, uh, it has flat space time uh, inside of the bubble. The uh, uh, coordinate time is equal to proper time in the, inside of that uh, flat region. So the mission control clocks uh, would be synchronized with the clocks on board of the spacecraft. Uh, and then the proper acceleration alpha in the bubble is formally zero. Uh, so when you, when you turned on the, uh, the, the space warp system, uh, the whole crew would not feel an infinite acceleration and go, smacking against the bulkhead and, and killing everybody on board and making for a very sad episode of Star Trek. Um, <clears throat> now, it does have one, dis, uh, one unappealing characteristic. Uh, after uh, uh, Miguel published his paper and, and people went to go try and figure out how much, uh, how much stuff would it take to make this concept work because it requires uh, um, exotic matter or negative vacuum energy. Uh, and so they did some calculations to figure out uh, what would you need to make uh, some type of a, a system that we would think about uh, actually work. And so the best estimates uh, that were done prior to 2011 were done by some colleagues of mine, uh, Dr. Richard Abusi, uh, Dr. Jerry Cleaver. Uh, they reduced the amount of stuff that's required to uh, something that's about the size of Jupiter. Uh, and so that's just uh, uh, quite impractical. Uh, and so the, the concept was really considered maybe nature can do it on a grand scale, but it's uh, uh, unlikely that we could uh, ever do something like this uh, in a, a purposeful sense. And so I got uh, asked to uh, come to the 100-year uh, uh, Starship Symposium and give a little bit of a talk on the concept of a space warp. Uh, so um, uh, as a result of uh, Pete Warden and some others kind of being visionary and, and asking for folks to kind of think about this, uh, uh, rather than just kind of relay everything that had been done before by myself and others, I, um, I decided to do a, a sensitivity analysis. I wanted to look at uh, what happens to the mathematics when I change uh, uh, some of the input parameters. And so I looked at and focused on, in this case, uh, the shell thickness parameter. Um, and so you see a couple of stills there from some videos we'll look at in just a second. Uh, so this is for a 10-meter uh, a diameter spacecraft. Uh, with an effective velocity of, of 10C. Uh, and the only thing I'm changing is the, the, the shell thickness parameter. So instead of having that, uh, that football with the, uh, the ring that goes around it, instead of that ring be, being a very a thin aspect ratio, say like a, a wedding band, if I change it where it looks more like uh, a lifesaver or an inner tube, 
uh, I can greatly change the magnitude of the York time. And to kind of put that in engineering parlance, uh, kind of like a, a strain rate, so to speak, on, on space time. <clears throat> and when you look at the, uh, uh, the energy density associated with that, the energy density uh, changes significantly. So just show you some of the animations to help you see. Uh, so the, as the thickness of the bubble uh, gets thicker because the ring is getting thicker, the magnitude of the York time uh, decreases significantly. Uh, and similarly for the energy density, uh, for that same set of cases, the energy density uh, collapses uh, many orders of magnitude. Uh, so what's, what's potentially going on with this, uh, this finding is that um, by changing the strain rate that we're having to put on space time, we're changing uh, how much energy is required to achieve that strain rate. So if I were to, uh, this podium is, is made out of wood, and so it's about, uh, I don't know, three quarters of an inch thick. If I were to try and take my, my thumb and my forefinger and, and compress, uh, compress the wood, again, using an engineering example, uh, compress the wood by uh, a quarter inch, um, you know, I, I'd, Although I'm from Texas, I can't do that. Maybe Pete can, but um, uh, it's beyond my capacity. But if I reduce the strain that I have to put on the wood uh, to maybe just a nanometer or two, then, then maybe I can do that. So that's kind of what you're seeing there is by changing the strain rate uh, for the same case, uh, we are uh, reducing the energy that's required. Now, going back just to point something out here, the, uh, you're, you're sacrificing some real estate in the center of the bubble. Uh, so you see the little flat island where those ideal conditions are is changing its overall size. So it is a, is a little bit of a trade. How much volume do you need uh, to house whatever you're trying to do uh, in a, uh, some fictional spacecraft? Now, space time is pretty stiff. This, this, uh, this wood is a fairly stiff uh, uh, material. If I could change the material properties uh, and make the wood uh, seem more like uh, a foam, uh, then for the same, uh, the same strain rate, uh, I can further reduce the amount of energy that's necessary to induce the, uh, the amount of strain on that, uh, that piece of material. So the question uh, that I looked at next is there something that we can do to try and look at uh, this, uh, this term that's in the, uh, uh, the Einstein tensor and the energy density tensor. Uh, and so uh, what I did next was look at uh, expanding the, uh, the Okubier metric into a higher dimensional manifold. Uh, and so I looked at uh, the Chung freeze metric uh, and did some uh, work with some of the null like geodesics between the two models uh, and uh, 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 found that if you were to go through and vary the intensity uh, in the ring, um, you can change the stiffness properties of space and potentially further reduce uh, the amount of stuff uh, that's necessary to maybe make this, uh, this uh, concept work. <clears throat> So I, uh, I culminated the, uh, the effort with a, a table that uh, kind of looked at um, this 10 meter diameter spacecraft varying the shell thickness parameter uh, and the, uh, the time varying potential d phi dt. Uh, and I wanted to uh, uh, duplicate the work done by Richard Abusi and Jerry, Jerry Cleaver. So I uh, set the, uh, the parameters such that I could uh, require uh, a Jupiter amount of exotic matter uh, up here. So you can see on the bottom there's some little cartoons that show uh, the relative aspect ratio of the ring uh, relative to the, 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 the little log scale here. Uh, and as you get further to the left, the ring is getting uh, infinitely thin. Uh, and so we can, for this 10 meter diameter spacecraft with an effective velocity of 10 C, I can yield the solution that uh, requires a Jupiter amount uh, of exotic matter. I could formally drive it to infinity. Um, but by using these uh, optimization techniques, we can reduce it uh, uh, non-trivially to, in this case, uh, uh, something about the size of the Voyager 1 spacecraft in terms of the uh, effective mass uh, of what you need to make the trick work. So uh, what this does is it, it moves the idea from the category of completely impossible uh, to maybe plausible. It doesn't say anything about feasible. Um, so unfortunately, that point usually gets missed a lot, uh, but at least uh, opens up the door that maybe it's interesting to go try and uh, perform some small experiments to try and see if we can uh, create some type of changes in optical properties in a very small scale uh, in the laboratory. And so that's some of the stuff we're uh, kind of rolling the rock down the road with uh, at our lab at JSC. And so we've got two, um, uh, two uh, apparatuses that we use. We have a, a Twyman Green uh, interferometer. And so this is where we have a test article that we put on one of the reference legs of the interferometer, uh, and we can uh, energize the test article to try and create a blue, in this case with our low fidelity test articles, uh, create a blue shifted frame 
uh, relative to the lab uh, and change the, uh, the perceived path length for the photons that move through this region on the interferometer. Uh, and so there'll be a slight change in the interference pattern on the interferometer uh, uh, that we, uh, uh, we can try and detect uh, using some of the software analysis techniques um, and maybe see if we can't uh, 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 see a, a manifestation of this in a very small sense. Uh, this shows a picture of uh, one of the, uh, the test setups on the uh, Twyman Green. I uh, see the test article there on one of the beam paths. Uh, you've got the laser on the left. Uh, it's a very standard setup for a Twyman Green. Uh, we've got the detector on the right that goes through the, uh, uh, the computer that collects the data uh, for the data runs. Um, and then the other uh, test setup that we have is a slightly different permutation on an interferometer. We have a Fabry Perot interferometer. Uh, and so the advantage of a Fabry Perot interferometer over a Twyman Green is that uh, you can pass a light beam through a particular region of interest many, many times. Uh, and so that increases the, uh, the measured magnitude of the effect uh, by a couple of orders of magnitude. Uh, so it's a way to take a, 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 a test implementation and get uh, a little bit higher level of fidelity. Uh, and so you can see um, on the bottom two pictures there, there's an example of uh, uh, a sodium source being run through a Michelson-Morley type of interferometer. Uh, you can see the interference pattern. Uh, but in the, in the Fabry Perot, because of these multiple uh, constructive and destructive interference uh, passes, you start to see the, uh, the atomic structure uh, of the, uh, the sodium source. And so you see the, the doublet and the Fabry Pro. And so you see a, a test set up there with the, the laser and the imager and then the Fabry Pro that's uh, uh, in the region where we we're trying to induce the blue shifted frame uh, with the uh, low fidelity test article. Now in the process of doing the test, we do turn the, the test, uh, test article on and off with a given frequency. Uh, and we, uh, we go through and for, uh, you see an image on the top right that shows an interference pattern uh, from the imager uh, and we'll go through it and run a test cycle where we run it over a, an extended period of time. Uh, and then we will do a, uh, uh, an FFT for each and every pixel. And then we will look for energy in the spectrum uh, based on how we were energizing and de-energizing uh, the test article. Uh, and you see on the bottom right, uh, that is a, uh, an FFT of the entire imager at the frequ frequency of interest. Uh, if there were no uh, phenomena present, then uh, in principle, that should just simply be uh, a flat blue surface, we uh, shouldn't see anything there. Uh, however, there are still, uh, when you're working with stuff of this magnitude, there are still false positives. So we, uh, we would by no means consider this definitive. This is just interesting and we're continuing to try and uh, eliminate uh, other uh, sources of false positives. Uh, now we have, uh, uh, there's a, a lab at uh, JSC that uh, was built for the Apollo program, uh, working with uh, inertial measurement units. Um, we uh, 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 kind of uh, were able to uh, get a little small footprint in that lab to be able to do some work and take advantage of uh, the seismic isolation that it has. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the big pneumatic piers that floats the entire floor. Uh, it's a pretty sizable lab, probably about uh, 30 feet by 40 feet, uh, uh, something like that. Uh, and so we can float the whole lab when we're doing testing. And although the lab without being floated uh, is pretty seismically quiet, uh, floating it does make a difference. Um, I, I will say this, when we, when we, uh, when we first uh, uh, brought the lab out of retirement, excuse me, the, the floating lab out of retirement, we climbed down into the, 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 the area there where you see the gentleman underneath the floor. We found a couple of uh, uh, suitcases of, of luggage uh, down there and we were a little nervous when we pulled those up when we opened those, what might be in those. But. There was nothing in them, so it was nothing exciting. So, uh, so anyway, this uh, this shows um, an interference pattern uh, with the lab uh, isolated and the lab not isolated uh, in terms of that uh, floating lab. So it does make uh, a little bit of difference in the quality uh, of the data that we collect. Uh, but we do have both options open, depending upon uh, how much time we have before we run a campaign to get the the center folks out to float the floor. Um, uh, I will say this, we, the floor had not been floated uh, in such a long period of time that apparently they had changed the doors uh, and when we floated the floor the first time, uh, it actually locked us in the room because it floated up above where the doors couldn't open. So that was, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so the next th thing we've been doing is uh, trying to get away from uh, an encapsulated uh, Fabry Pro and go to an open air Etalon uh, set of mirrors where we, uh, we position the mirrors basically in the same orientation that they were inside of the, uh, the encapsulated uh, Fabry Pro, just trying to go through and address some, uh, uh, some sources of mimicry to make sure 
Uh, is the signal still there? Can we, can we kill the signal or attribute it to some, some boring explanation? Uh, and so we, uh, we went through the process of taking a look at um, uh, testing with an open air etalon. Uh, and we, uh, we still see uh, uh, some energy in the spectrum uh, where we would uh, anticipate uh, to see it. Uh, but again, this is definitely not uh, definitive by any stretch. Um, another way to test at some point to maybe uh, also address other sources of mimicry would be uh, a time of flight approach where uh, we could take a helium neon laser uh, and we could run it through an optical chopper uh, that would uh, create light pulses that we could then send through uh, this racetrack uh, uh, and go through in time, the time how long it takes for a photon to uh, run through the, uh, the test apparatus with a, a test device not energized, uh, and then time how long it takes for a photon to run through the, uh, uh, the test apparatus with the device uh, uh, off or on, back and forth, and compare the two. And that can be a different way of detecting the phenomena that uh, if you saw some data that looked like what you wanted on this apparatus, if you didn't see commensurate behavior here, that might be a way for you to say it's some other uh, boring uh, explanation. Now, the one thing that, um, uh, to me, everyone always thinks about the, the romantic vision on the right, right, in terms of uh, being on the, on the bridge of some uh, spaceship going off to destinations very, very far away. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that's, that's important, and it is something that uh, kind of motivates us in some way. Um, but you know, I also look at how do we, you know, what do we do to get out of low Earth orbit? What do we need to do to uh, support uh, an asteroid mission in a distant retrograde orbit? What do we need to do uh, to get out to Mars? Uh, and so in terms of interstellar precursors, right, we only have a spacecraft at 120 uh, AU. So while I talked about, um, 10C for some of the stuff I did for the calculations. Um, what about 0.01C? Uh, that's a significantly lower uh, velocity compared to that, but compared to anything we've done to date, uh, that's uh, unbelievably fast. So that may still have some, uh, some interest at some point if we could ever uh, start to mature this past just the, the, uh, the concept in a lab uh, perspective. So, you know, I, uh, if we were to uh, ever to uh, move things forward, that's something to me that I think there'd be plenty of interesting applications with uh, speeds like that. So, <clears throat> now this was uh, this is a um, kind of like an education outreach piece that I did uh, with some folks from uh, CBS. I worked with um, uh, Mike Akuda uh, and Mark Rademacher. Um, the concept you see here is uh, based on some artwork uh, that. Uh, Matt Jeffries did back in the 60s for the TV show. Uh, he's the guy that kind of came up with the familiar sombrero look that we all know from the TV show. Uh, uh, and so he had another version that he generated uh, that I think was one of his favorite. Uh, and so this is a modern rendering uh, done by uh, Mark Rademacher based on uh, that uh, artistic uh, uh, concept that he developed. Now the thing that's cool to me is, uh, you know, just going through the math with you guys, uh, you can see that this concept is, uh, uh, it's got some things that are almost what the mathematics requires. It's got these rings that go around the spacecraft, uh, and it's got this centrally located spacecraft. Uh, but it does have a few things that are not correct uh, uh, based on the, the energy optimization findings and what, uh, where the, the, the warp bubble would actually be. Uh, the rings on the spacecraft are too thin, uh, so they're going to drive the energy requirements to be uh, non-trivial. Uh, so you'd want the, uh, the rings to be a little different. Uh, and then the central portion of the spacecraft is uh, uh, not located uh, properly, and so when the, the bubble were to form, it would actually uh, cut the bridge off the spacecraft and the bridge would float away and Scotty would probably be fired. Um, so I worked with the guys to kind of upgrade this concept uh, with the mathematics, and so we, uh, we did an education outreach for like a Ships of the Lion counter where we had a little paragraph that reminded people we're still in low Earth orbit, we've got a lot of work to go do. If this is interesting to you, uh, there's plenty of other work that we need to, to work on, so please follow your, your, your passion and work on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, but uh, the, the, the concept's got these uh, much thicker rings, so it's considerably more uh, athletic looking. Uh, and then the little spaceship is um, uh, kind of more properly located uh, within what would be called the Fenning region. Uh, so it's in that little flat space time, so uh, uh, things would be a little bit uh, uh, better for the crew. Um, now as we move forward, uh, what we want to do is we want to um, 
we want to move to a higher fidelity test article. So you see a concept we're still uh, working on right now in terms of the, uh, uh, some of the analysis. Uh, we want to explore the DFDT dependency. Remember I said that that was one of the two energy optimization techniques. Uh, and so we want to go through and explore uh, the DFDT dependency. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the stuff that we're doing with the Q-thruster technology has uh, uh, some potential pertinence to this. And so we're using the, uh, uh, the, the physics models for that to kind of guide the, the, the construction and development of a test article to go through and see if we uh, can explore a much larger magnitude of DFDT. And you kind of see a little uh, cartoon of some of the modes we're looking at and some of the specific details we're looking at uh, uh, to put on the inside of the test apparatus. Um, so that takes me through to the next one. That's kind of the interstellar uh, uh, portion of the talk. Thank you. 